So welcome to the 2021 inaugural Cornell Emerging Markets Team Seminar Series. On behalf of the co-directors, Professor Christopher Marcos and Professor Arna Basu, and also Kunian Ekiao, who has been a great PhD student and great behind these seminars, I want to welcome you all. First, uh, information about the other webinars that we will be organizing. So I'll introduce Ricardo in a minute, but the next one will be March 2nd, and we'll uh, welcome Johanna Mai, who is Professor of Organization, Strategy, and Leadership at the Hertz School of Governance, the co-director of the Global Innovation for Impact Lab at the Stanford Center of Philanthropy and Civil Society. Then on April 2nd, we'll welcome Claudio Ferraz. Thank you, Professor and colleague Daniela Escur, for inviting him. He's a professor and scientific director for Latin America at the Vancouver School of Economics at the University of British Columbia. And then on May 7, thank you, colleague and Professor Luo Zuo, uh, for inviting him. So we'll, come T, we'll welcome T.G. Wong on May 7, who is the Joseph Devil Professor of Business Administration and also expert on corporate governance in emerging markets. Just two words about uh, the, uh, what is a theme. So with the launch of Cornell um, Johnson College of Business, the idea was to find ways to integrate faculties, research and work. And the idea was to put them together under themes. So then only in one college, no, in the three colleges, that's the idea. And they are seed funded for three years. And then also they have to be successful involving other colleagues and behind these teams, besides the interim directors, Christopher Marcos, Arnab Basso and myself, Lourdes Casanova, we have to, uh, we count on uh, Chris Barrett from Dyson, Esor Prasad also from Dyson, Kosik Basu, and also the Pretty Dean, Andrew Caroli, that were all in part of the initial team who pushed for the approval of the things. It took us a while. But the theme was approved in July 2020, and we launched the theme on September 18 in an event organized by the three pillar institutes of the college, the SMART program at the Margin Markets program in Dyson with professors Ed Mabaya and Dunge Kiiti, the Cornell Institute for China Economic Research, with whom we have collaborated in a number of initiatives with Professor Panle, Panle Gwardwick and Shan Jun Li, and also we collaborated with other centers of Cornell, Cornell China Center, thank you, Professor Jing Hua, the Inoundi Center, thank you very much, Rachel, Rachel Riedel, and the Tata Cornell Institute of Agriculture and Nutrition, thank you, Professor Prabhu Pingali, and also the support of the Vice Provost of International Affairs, Professor Wendy Wolford. Also in the fall semester, we hosted, so the theme hosted, the fifth Global Strategy and Emerging Markets 2020 under the theme of competing in the digital world on November 7 and 8. And we collaborated with the Center of Emerging Markets, Professor Ravi Ramamurti at Northeastern University, the Jack Austin Center for uh, Asia Pacific Business Studies at Simon Fraser University, in the Center for Global Business at the University of Texas, Dallas, with Professor Mike Peng. But today we are here because we are welcoming home Professor Ricardo Hausman, and I'll tell you why we welcome him home. He, the title of his presentation will be The Know-How Approach to Economic Development. He's the director of the Growth Lab at Harvard Center for International Development, and the Rafik Hariri, Professor of the Practice of International Political Economy at Harvard Kennedy School. And also before he was, so he has been also uh, making a difference from multilaterals. Uh, he was the chief economist of the Inter-American Development Bank between 94 and the, and the year 2000. He's originally from Venezuela and has done a lot for his country where he was Minister of State and also Governor for Venezuela for both the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. He has written a number of books, papers, 
chapters. And I want to mention one of the last ones, and he will be introducing uh, another one in his presentation, the one published in 2005 by Chicago uh, University Press. The title is Other People's Money, and I think very important in today's world because it's debt denomination in financial fragility in emerging markets. I, I, I would like to say that he's as close as you can get as an influencer in the academic world. Let me tell you that his voice is heard, whatever he says in Latin America and emerging markets, his opinion counts. He also has worked with a number of organizations, among others, the World Economic Forum, where, where I had the privilege to meet him and where I had asked him for more than three years to please come to Cornell. So the, it took me more than three years and also the COVID had to happen. But just let me finish with the most important feature of Professor Ricardo Hausmann, who is a triple Cornelian. First, Bachelor in Science in Engineering and Applied Physics, not an easy one. Cornell's, Cornell is not easy, but this one is particularly difficult. And then PhD in Economics in 1981, and also a Master's in Economics. So he worked with uh, Professor Emeritus Tom, Day Tom Davis, also with Professor, ja uh, late Professor Jaroslav Bank, uh, Vanek, uh, who passed away, unfortunately. And Professor Tom Davis is sick and unfortunately unable to join us today. But his wife is sending their best regards from both of, from both of them. Ricardo, welcome home. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lourdes. Thank you very much. Uh, it really brings me uh, all sorts of emotions. It was August 1973 when I went as a freshman to Cornell. Uh, that was 47 years ago last summer. I finished my PhD. In those days, you could do it in four years. I finished my PhD in 1981, so it will be 40 years this summer. I remember I stayed my first year in West Campus and my second year in North Campus. And I, I remember the falls. I remember there were many Greek restaurants at the time for some reason. I don't know if they're still around, um, but I have very, very fond memories. I got there in August 73. In September 73, 11th was the coup in Chile. So I got involved in an organization that was called the Committee on US Latin American Relations, which was a, a university wide uh, center. And, and there I got some friends who eventually got me interested in economics. So I finished my, my degree in engineering, but I developed my passion in, for economics through this networking at Cornell. So, so I, have, uh, I have very, very fond memories of, of those years and I'm glad to be to be here with you. I'm going to be sharing you with you like a summary of my you know, 20 or so years of research on thinking about growth. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll try to move as quickly as possible through the presentation so that I can, I can um, uh, 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 you know, get to questions and, and the interesting part. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to, uh, try to answer this big question, which is uh, why is it that when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, and he was wondering why are some nations rich and other nations poor, the richest country in the world was in those days the Netherlands. It had an income per capita which was about four times the income per capita of the poorest countries in the world, which were many which were just that subsistence. Okay, So today, if you look at the World Development Indicators, if you look at the GDP per capita and market prices in Malawi, it's, it's this, it's less than a dollar a day. If you multiply by four the income per capita of Malawi, you get to Haiti, which is the poorest country in the Americas. So, so the gap of four to one is now the gap between say Malawi and, and Haiti, or even you know, uh, you know, uh, probably Ethiopia. If you, if you multiply Malawi, Haiti by four, you get to Morocco. If you multiply Morocco by four, you get to Poland or Argentina. And if you multiply Poland by four, you get to Singapore. 
So a problem that was a problem of four to one has become a problem of something like 256 to one, which is scientific proof, if you want, that the problem does not go away by just reading Adam Smith. So the reason why that happened is that if you look at GDP per capita throughout history, it looks a little bit like this hockey stick. It was flat forever and something we like to call the Malthusian trap. And then over the last two centuries, we've seen this incredible increase in incomes. But if we zoom in to those increases in incomes, you see that something happened in, 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 in the last two centuries that hadn't happened before. And so when you measure income differences now, they look huge relative to what they were, say, when Adam Smith wrote, OK? Um, so that's what we call the great divergence. And the question is, why the hell did this happen this way? Why not some other way, right? So one question is, why can you take this picture in the world today and take this picture in the world today? Because if I ask you to go out and take a picture of a typewriter, I challenge you to take a picture of a typewriter. They don't exist anymore. Uh, but if for some reason, and, and that's because, you know, because better technologies, PCs and so on have displaced typewriters. They do many more things at a cheaper price. But uh, this technology kind of survives with this technology. And the question that you might ask yourself is why? So there's been many, many answers to this question. And one that is popular in the literature is that it's all about institutions and so on. I am going to take a different tack. I'm going to say that in, in the, the, this enormous gap of incomes is essentially an expression of an enormous gap in technology in the way people work, in the kinds of processes that they use to make things, to change the world, whether it's making food, making clothing, making houses, but also you know, collecting taxes, administering justice, uh, entertaining people. Okay, So I'm taking you know, technology as the kinds of, of things we do to transform the world so that it has a shape we want it to be. Okay, Now, technology is a word that economists uh, love, uh, love, they use it a lot. Uh, typically, when they put it in a production function, it's just a parameter that makes everything else more productive. We call it total factor productivity. So we sort of like define it as an outcome of something. It's something that makes uh, the other factors of production more productive, right? So uh, it's defined that way, kind of. But it doesn't, that doesn't tell you what it is. What is technology, right? And I'm going to give you a definition of technology. And I'm going to use that definition of technology to answer the question, why the hell does technology not diffuse? Why, why is it that people in the world um, uh, do, you do things this way if you could do things this way, right? Um, why do they use lousy technologies when they could be using better technologies, OK? So, so I'm going to say that technology, I'm going to give you a definition of technology that says that technology is a little bit like the Christian God, okay? In the sense that the Christian God, they tell me, I'm not an expert in the topic because I'm not Christian, but uh, I'm Jewish, but uh, they tell me that the Christian God is three and one. It's one and three, three and one, that's what they tell me. Lourdes will correct me. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, but it's only one, but it's three. So I'm going to say the same thing about technology. It's three and one. It's only one thing, something you might want to call a prescriptive knowledge, knowledge about how to do things in the world, how to change the world in shapes that we want it to, to be. But it's knowledge that takes three forms. It takes the form of embodied knowledge in tools, so here, all the knowledge of the tool is in the tool, and you just need to know, know how to use it. But, but a, all the knowledge that went into making it is crystallized in the tool. So that's what we call embodied knowledge. We have what we like to call codified knowledge in codes, recipes, formulas, algorithms, how to do manuals, routines, OK? Here, in, it's represented as ink over paper. But it's not in the ink and it's not in the paper. It's in the symbols that they represent. It's in the code, if you want. And if you take the picture of this paper with its ink and the paper, 
it, it doesn't change its meaning, right? It, 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 it's, it's in the symbols, right? So it's codified knowledge. And um, so if that's all there was, well, the world could be flat, but because we could put the, the tools in, in containers and ship them around, and we could put the codes on the web and make them available to everybody. And if, if all the technology was, was tools and codes, that is embodied knowledge and codified knowledge, the world would be flat, okay? But I told you that there's a third, third uh, part of the Trinity. And you know that third part by answering the question, what do you do when your tooth hurts? And the answer is not, you go to your significant other and ask them to download an article from the web and fix the problem for you, right? No, you go to an expert and the expert uh, uses tools and he's using tools here. The expert follows protocols, right? So he uses some codified knowledge, but the expert mixes the tools and the codes with something that he has in his brain that we don't have, which is the ability to look into our mouth and see things we don't see, and the ability to use those tools to, in, a, in such a way that he fixes problems that we wouldn't know how to fix. And that third substance is something we call tacit knowledge or know-how in brains, okay? So it's, uh, technology is tools, codes, and know-how. It's three forms of knowledge. It's codified, it's embodied knowledge and tools, codified knowledge in, in codes and recipes and, and, and protocols and how to do manuals and tacit knowledge in brains and only in brains, okay? So know-how is not knowledge in the sense that know-how involves no understanding. I mean, here is Rafa Nadal. I do this in you know, Lourdes. I'm sure he's a hero of yours, Lourdes. Uh, uh, he's Catalonian. Uh, um, uh, uh, he knows how to answer a serve, but it's not that he understands what he does when he answers a serve. He does, has no time to think. The ball is going at him at 140 miles an hour. His brain knows how to do things. He doesn't know how to do things in the same way uh, as we think, we say we know how to walk, but we don't really know how to walk. Our brain knows how to walk. If I ask you, what muscles do you move when you walk? In what order do you move your muscles? How do you keep your balance? How do you regulate your heart and your breathing while you walk? You don't know how to do any of those things. Your brain does. So in the same way, know-how is in the brain, in that, in that part of the brain, your, your self does not have access to. Okay, so it does not involve understanding. It's not, ah, I got an aha moment and now I have the know how. No, the know how is something that in, in Malcolm Gagel likes to say that it takes 10,000 hours to become good at something. It's this rewiring of the brain. Okay, so, so it's these three things that in know how is. Know how involves no, no comprehension, so it does not involve understanding. In, and what matters for technology is not individual know-how or copies of the same individual know-how. It involves team know-how and know-how about different things. That is people who are playing different functions know about different things. So for example, in some world, you might say that this guy knows how to fly this plane, but a, a plane is not flown by an individual. A plane requires to implement that technology. It requires all these other people that know about different things and they all need to come together to implement that technology, okay? So products are going to differ in the number of people with different bits of know-how that have to cooperate. Because one of the problems of, of increasing the amount of know-how in society is that we are all very limited. If, if Malcolm Gladwell is right and it takes 10,000 hours to become good at something, we don't have 10,000 hours to spare. So the way the world, the know-how grows in society is by putting different bits of know-how in different heads. It's, you know, Adam Smith wrote about the division of, of labor. It's really about the division of know-how that allows you to put different bits of know-how in different heads so that the whole knows more than the parts. And you can ask yourself your, the question, uh, how many different heads do I need to bring together to make a product? Okay, so products are going to differ in the number of these individuals that have to come in, in to, 
to, to work together. I like to call a person bite the amount of know-how that fits in a person's head in the sense that your dentist tends not to be your lawyer, right? Um, that it takes too long to be a dentist to then start becoming a lawyer, right? So, so uh, how many different um, uh, specializations are there? I call it, since I don't know how many bites it takes, I call it a person bite. Okay, so um, to create a product that has, that requires more than one person bite, you need more than one person. And we aggregate people, we aggregate this know-how in networks of individuals we call firms, so in a firm, you know, you have people who know about accounting, about finance, about uh, taxes, about human resource management, about procurement, about production, about sales, about marketing. So, so you have specialists in a bunch of all these things that the Johnson School teaches, right? Uh, and, in, uh, and in networks of firms, right? Uh, so all that know-how has to be brought together. So we can ask the question, look at production and ask the question, how many people do I need to bring together to make something? So all of these products here are made by the subsistence farming family in Ecuador, okay? You can imagine families that each one is making these different products, right? They're no, not subsistence farmers. They are not autonomous. Like the butcher cannot make a hamburger because to make a hamburger, he needs bread, right? But each one of them can be run by a family. So it's like a... Now, no family knows how to make these products. And you might say that no country can make this product, that this product requires all of these different um, companies across all of these different geographies, not because they're going to make many airplanes, just to make one airplane. Because the know-how needed to make the turbine is very different from the know-how needed to make the landing gear, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that production, is about, it's not about big. This is a big company, right? Uh, but everybody is sort of like doing the same thing. This is, uh, they're making chicken parts. Uh, they, but everybody here is sort of like knows how to do the same thing. A uh, modern production often requires something like this, where everybody's bringing a different skill and it's a combination of the skill that makes the symphony. So a person doesn't make a symphony, an orchestra makes a symphony, and, and each one brings something different to, to the story. So I'm going to try to capture this in something I like to call the Scrabble theory of economic development, okay? And, and the Scrabble theory says the following, that the world is not made by capital and labor and human capital. The world is made by a bunch of different capabilities, okay? Maybe these are bits of know-how or aggregations of bits of know-how and so on. So these are capabilities, and there's a, you know, very, a long literature that's taught more in business schools than in economics departments about the capability theory of the firm, okay? And places are going to have collections of these capabilities. They're going to have like collections of letters. And so I can characterize a country as being a collection of capabilities. A product is something that you do with these capabilities. So that's why I call it Scrabble. It's like a, a, a product is a combination of letters. It's a combination of these capabilities, okay? So, so um, it, 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 I'm going to think of countries or places, it doesn't have to be a country, it could be a municipality, uh, a state, as a collection of capabilities, characterized, if you want, by a certain matrix, a capability, um, a country capability matrix, okay? A product is going to be something like an input-output matrix. It's going to be characterized by the capability the product requires, okay? I'm going to call it the PPA, the, the product capability matrix. And I'm going to assume that a country is able to make a product if it has all the letters that the product requires. If its endowment of capabilities encompasses the capabilities needed to make the product. And this is something I'm going to call the MCP matrix. Is C is for country and P is for product and A is for ability, if you want. So this is um, a matrix of countries and products. You know, every place is going to be characterized by the things it makes, but that's sort of like a reflection of the capabilities it has, okay? Now, 
um, when we developed this theory, we assumed we could not see the country capability matrix and we could not see the product capability matrix, but we could see the MCP. And what I'm going to show you today is how far you can get if you just observe the MCP and analyze this MCP and try to infer the capabilities that a country has and infer the capabilities that a product requires just by looking at the MCP. Now, interestingly, um, so, so the idea is that this is the world as it is, but this is sort of like, uh, we, we can't see the capabilities. This is uh, the, word, the word we can observe and, and measure and estimate, okay? So this is the MCP. Every row here is a country, every column here is a product, and every pixel is the intensity with which this, each country uh, exports each product. This is using trade data, okay? Uh, so the MCP matrix is observable. You can download it. And here is for Chile. This Every row here is a municipality. Every column here is an industry. And, and every dot is whether the, that industry exists in that municipality. Okay. And notice that these two matrices have a lot of structure. They tend to be triangular. We call that nested. They tend to be nested in the sense that the lower... Um, uh, to put it in one way, uh, some, some countries make everything. Other countries make very few things, but the countries that make few things make things that everybody makes. And the countries that make many things make those things too, but makes things that few other countries make. Okay, so it's like these countries have more letters so they can make more words and these countries have fewer letters, they can make fewer words, but the words they can make are typically short words that everybody can make. Okay, so it's a little bit. So when we go back to this picture. And we ask ourselves, what do you see in this picture? You might say, uh, you know, a neoclassical economist would say the guy on the left works with, you know, maybe less education. He maybe works with less capital, maybe with less land than the guy on the right. And he would explain it in terms of factors of production. If you want to explain it in terms of technology and knowledge, we would say that the guy on the left, uh, he knows a lot. He, he knows how to take care of his bulls. He knows how to make his own seeds, his own dung. He decides when to plant and everything. So he has a lot of know-how. The guy on the right, he knows how to drive this harvester. He has no clue how to make a harvester. He has no clue how to make the gasoline that goes into the harvester. He has no clue how to make, he, he doesn't even know what genetically modified seeds means doesn't know what a gene is. He doesn't know about fertilizers. He doesn't know how to make agrochemicals, insecticides. He doesn't know any of that, right? He is a letter in a very long word. The guy on the left is maybe a one letter word. So the difference in these two things is in the amount of knowledge they're mobilizing at the point of production, okay? And that's why the guy on the left, he can be very autonomous. The guy on the right, if the machine breaks down, he knows the phone number of whom to call. That know-how is not in himself, it's in the network. It's in the network, okay? And it's the ability to create those networks that combine the knowledge that is behind production. And it's the difficulties in doing that that complicates the process of development. So let's start extracting some some uh, testable implications from what I say. I would say that countries that have more letters should be able to make more words. The more letters you have, the more words you can make. So they would be more diversified. So for example, here on the left, you have the exports of Nigeria, which is a country of 200 million people. On the right, you have the exports of Austria, which is a country of like eight, nine million people. You see that Austria makes a hell of a lot of things. And Nigeria makes few things, okay? So you can infer something about the letters that these countries have by the number of things they do well enough to sell abroad, okay? Second thing, products that require more letters are going to be harder to make. So they're going to be made in fewer places, okay? So on the left, you have the number of countries that export raw wood. And on the right, you see the number of countries that export microscopes, okay? And you see that everybody exports raw wood uh, from, you know, 
the US, Russia, Canada, Malaysia, Laos, Laos, everybody. And on the right, you have sort of like the usual suspects, very few countries. So how many countries export a good tells you how hard it is to make that good indirectly. We call that the, average, the ubiquity of the good, okay? The number of countries that make that product. So in, if, if you take the MCP matrix, uh, you have the countries, uh, let me uh, maybe, let me skip that for a second once. So uh, uh, if you have, say the MCP matrix looks like this, there are five products and three countries. This country makes only one product. This country makes these three products and this country makes five products. So that's the diversity of a country is the number of products that it makes. The ubiquity of the product is the number of countries that make it. It's the degree of this network seen from the point of view of the product, okay? So which is the most diversified country? It's the Netherlands. Which is the most ubiquitous product? It's frozen fish. It's made by everybody, right? In which is the least ubiquitous product? Well, it's, it's x-ray machine and medicaments. Who makes x-ray machine and medicaments? Well, the country that makes everything, okay? so. That's why this matrix tends to be uh, 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 triangular. That's why it's nested, okay? So, so we can calculate the number of products a country makes. We can calculate the number of countries that make a product. And we can calculate on average how many other countries make the things you make, okay? And so the more, the more uh, letters you have, the longer the words you can put together and the fewer the countries that can make the things you do. So the lower the average ubiquity of the things you do. So if we look at the world, we can ask how many countries, how many products does your country make and how many other countries make the things you make? And in this graph, you see you have the rich countries over here, they make many things and things that are done by few countries. And the poor countries over here, they make few things, but things that are done by many countries. That's what the world would look like if these countries have a lot of letters and these countries have few letters, okay? So if you have few letters, the number of words you can do are, are fewer, but also easier to make. And if you look within Chile, for example, these are municipalities in Chile. This is Santiago, Las Condes, and Providencia, all municipalities of Santiago. And this is where the penguins live, okay? So, so they make few things and things everybody knows how to make. And this is true about states in Mexico. Uh, this is true about uh, cities in Mexico. This is true about uh, cities in Turkey. You know, uh, this is true about uh, uh, departments in Colombia. Uh, this is true about uh, districts in Sri Lanka. Wherever we go, we try to see what are the capabilities that a place has by looking at the things that they're able to do. And you see these enormous differences in diversity and in the average ubiquity of the things different places do. So with this, it, it says that this MCP matrix contains some information about, about the underlying capabilities. And um, we can take these matrices and process them a little bit. So uh, we, we take this matrix and uh, uh, the MCP matrix, we take the transpose of it, we, we multiply it by the average ubiquity of products, by the ubiquity of the products, which is just you know, how many things a product makes. You take this ma combined matrix now, it's a matrix of products, um, uh, and we call it, calculate the economic complexity index as uh, the eigenvector of this matrix and the product complexity index as the eigenvector of this matrix. I think I got them upside down actually, now that I look at the formulas. So this is just manipulating this matrix that we can estimate from the world, okay? And it's going to tell us that these are the more co most complex products in the world. And these are the least complex products in the world. So sh these are sort of like the shortest words and these are the longest words, if you want. And this is the economic complexity of the world, okay? So it tells us that the US is very complex, that Germany is a bit more complex than Spain, that is South Africa is the most complex country in Sub-Saharan Africa, that Thailand is more complex than Indonesia, that Brazil is more complex than Chile, that Venezuela, my own country is very pale, right? So it tells you something about that. And you might say, well, who cares? It's another index, but I can ask myself, uh, does this have anything to do with how rich you are? 
And here I have the economic complexity index and the income per capita of countries. In blue, you have countries where natural resources are not very important. And for those countries, the R-square is very high. It's 0.75, the R-square there. For the red countries, they tend to be above the blue countries. Why? Well, because they have natural resources. But if you control for the natural resources you, they have, you get this relationship. OK? So this relationship says there apparently there is some relationship between how many letters you have, you know, the economic complexity of your country, the capabilities you have as expressed in the, in the number of different things that you are able to do and how many other countries are able to do what you do, right? So just look at the MCP matrix, okay? So you would say it's not bad, the R square is 0.73, but that's not the point. I mean, that would, you know, many things are correlated with income per capita, like, but you might ask yourself the question, uh, India, why are you down there? Given how much you know, uh, you should be much richer. Well, maybe that's the reason why India has been growing so fast in the last decade. If you agree, Greece, what the hell are you doing there? How did you get to be so rich given how little you know? Well, guess what? Uh, these countries have been converging to uh, this level of income. So we have shown that uh, 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 the number of the, your economic complexity determines sort of like where you're going, where you're going. And that's sort of captured in this, in this uh, illustration of, of, uh, of a regression framework. Where I have here is the error calculated in 1998. And this is the growth rate of the country between 1998 and 2008. So this would put India would have a positive deviance and, and uh, Greece would have a, a negative deviance. So India would have grown a lot. It would be expected to grow a lot because they already have what it takes to be richer than they are. While Greece would be expected to grow very little. And that is borne by the data. Okay, so that means that the problem of development is not the problem of getting more machines because those are easy to move around. We can create an NGO to give them the machines. It's not about get, getting the codes. The codes, you know, we'll put them on the web, we'll send them an email, they can get it. The cost of reproduction is zero. It's the know-how. It's the know-how that is generating the problem that's harder to move. And that is generating the problem because it faces this chicken and egg problem. I know that you guys are paying a lot of attention and you'll notice that this is not a chicken but a rooster but you'll forgive me. Um, uh, so the problem is this, you cannot make watches without watchmakers, but you cannot learn to become a watchmaker in a place that doesn't make watches. So how do you start making watches if in order to make watches, you have to know how to make watches, but you don't know how to make watches because you don't make watches, okay? So that is the chicken and egg problem that, it, that this, uh, uh, process has to solve. And that's a little bit of related to this question, which of these animals is out of the group and which two animals sort of belong together? So some people say, well, the, Af Af the lion and, and the zebra are from Africa, uh, but maybe the lion and the bear uh, eat animals that eat grass, I don't know. But I told you, not to pay attention to those theories, but to pay attention to the Scrabble theory of development. And in the Scrabble theory of development, a zebra is just a bear with a Z. So to go from bear to zebra, you just need one letter. To go from bear to lion, you can throw away all your letters and you need four letters that you don't have. So in order to adopt technology, it's much easier to move from bear to zebra. You only have to solve one chicken and egg problem. But to go from bear to lion, you know, it, you have to solve four chicken and egg problems. And you have no advantage in particular to do that, that transition. So what we need is a description of technology that uh, would put different products in different distances from each other based on how similar are the capability sets that you need, okay? So we're going to imagine the world as being made of products. These products are embodiments of technologies, if you want, or baskets of technologies. 
And I want to know how related is one product to another, okay? So one way in which a, a, a two products are likely to be very similar is if the same, if the countries that export one also export the other. For example, this product here, diodes, is exported by nine countries. Of those nine countries that export diodes, eight countries export electron mic microcircuits. Okay, and um, eight countries export printed circuits, all eight export printed circuits. So the ones that know how to do this also know how to do that. You know, so the countries that know how to make left-hand side shoes also know how to make right-hand side shoes. It must be that those two goods tend to use the same letters. So the idea is that by looking in the MCP, we can, uh, uh, the MCP matrix, I'm just you know, using transpose here, it's just, uh, this is a, a diagonal matrix with one over the ubiquity of the products, so it just divides by the number of products. And this is by the diversity, one over the diversity of the country, so it just divides by the number of countries. So it's just, this is just uh, the implementation of this, of this calculation. Of each product, uh, how many export one product, how many export the other product, and what is the joint? How many are exported by both? Okay. So if 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 all the countries if if all the countries that export product A also export product B, it must be that product A and B are highly related. Okay. So a, so now you get a matrix, which is the distances between products, and now we need to represent that matrix. And we chose to represent that matrix with this uh, network representation. Okay, where here every circle is a product, the size of the circle is the size of international trade in that product. And the links tell you how tightly related they are to other things. So this green cluster here is garments. This brown cluster here is agro processing. This red cluster here is construction materials. This blue cluster here is machinery. This purple cluster here is chemicals. This light blue cluster here is electronics. And then you have a wide periphery of poorly connected products. Like this one at the end of the world here is oil. This one at the end of the world here is mining. Okay, fish are over here. Okay, so that's, that's the shape of technology, if you want, in this representation. Okay, so in principle, we'd say if, if you know how to make cars, it's easier to make trucks than if you know how to make coffee and, and you try to make trucks. Okay, so, so, so products are going to differ in three dimensions. Um, one is how connected they are. Uh, that is, if you think of this as a forest, how dense is the forest around where you are? Okay, so here the forest is very dense. Here the forest is very dense. This is garments, this is machinery. So the connectedness, garments and machinery are fairly connected. But this is how complex is the product. How long is the word, if you want? And machinery is more complex than garments. And oil is a very short word that's very disconnected, OK? OK, as compared to, say, fish that is more connected. It requires more capabilities, OK? So that means that we can represent a country as where it is in this technology space. So for example, this is my home country, Venezuela. You have in color the products in which Venezuela had comparative advantage. So this is you know, a gorilla here, this is oil and, and gas and so on. But the gray means we don't have anything there. Only the colored ones means that we have something there. This is Mexico. See, Mexico is much more populated. Uh, and this is Austria, is much, much more populated, right? In terms, they do much more things. I showed you the export basket of, of Austria before. OK, so there's another representation. Now, we can ask ourselves, do these monkeys move? Well, eh, and guess what? They, they move. And, and the process of development, we would say, is the process of acquiring letters so that you are able to make more goods and more complex goods. No? So, so these monkeys are going to move in this forest. I'm going to show you very briefly Thailand and Ghana. In, eh, they both started in 1962 at very similar levels of income. Uh, this is the evolution of schooling. Uh, this is just to emphasize that know-how is not schooling. 
So Ghana accumulated more years of schooling of its labor force than Thailand. They made more progress, plus education in Ghana is in English. So, uh, But Ghana in 1962 was exporting cocoa, wood, and maybe some mines. Uh, Thailand in 1962 has more or less similar colors, uh, a little bit more diversified, but all in, in natural products, rice, um, corn, uh, other things about rice, uh, rubber, etc., and some mining. Okay, this is where they were in the product space in 1965. I'm going to ask you. I'm highlighting the products in which they had comparative advantage in 1965. So this is 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, 2000, 2005, 2010. I'm going to go back so that you see it again. You see, they started with. Very few monkeys, we would kind of say, so, you know, monkeys live in a tree, off a tree. So th these are firms. That's what a, 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 you know, the fact that you're producing something means that you have a firm making that. So we call that a, a monkey in a tree. So, okay. So it, they got in 70, they got these two monkeys in the, in the, in the textile garment. Then boom, they moved all through the textile garment. Then by 1980, they got two monkeys here in the electronics cluster. And by 85, they got more and then more on the electronics cluster. They moved here into the agro-business cluster. And now they, they ended up uh, moving into the uh, machinery cluster, OK? So when you look at, Ghana, uh, at, um, uh, at uh, Ghana's evolution, this was their, their export basket in 1962, cocoa, wood, etc. This was their export basket in 2010. Uh, cocoa beans, cocoa butter, cocoa paste, cocoa whatever, manganese, uh, a bit of gold. Exports per capita and constant dollars went nowhere, if anything, down. This was Thailand in 1962. This is Thailand now. They, 62 now. So they got into a ton of things. They, again, these are exports per capita and constant dollars. Okay, they they went from fifty dollars to you know five thousand dollars. Okay, so and this is what happened to their incomes per capita. So they did not diverge in years of schooling. They diverged dramatically in income per capita. In, in, so in now Ghana, is, Thailand is over six times richer than Ghana. So we can look at how many jumps a country makes and how many monkeys jump to new trees in each country. So here you have some some statistics. You can look at it, how development is really about change, not about specializing in your areas of comparative advantage, but changing your comparative advantage, becoming good at different things and more things. This is China's market share in the world, first in garments, then in electronics, then in machinery. And you see that it, it, they, they became good at garments, then they became good at electronics, then they become good at machinery. You see a similar thing in in, in Korea, they became good at garments, then they became good at electronics. They sort of like abandoned garments because they became good at machinery, transport equipment, chemicals, and so on. So you see this transformation of the monkeys moving in this space, okay? But no, I've done a lot of work on Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka got kicked around in, in agriculture. It got into garments, but it didn't move into the other thing. So it got stuck for some reason in the process. The monkeys did not continue uh, jumping. So how do we explain growth in this world? We explain growth by looking at, at these two things, whether a country has more than enough letters to be richer than it is, say, like India, or if it doesn't have enough letters, say, like Greece. OK, so this is one dimension. The other dimension that we like to look at is how close are your monkeys from empty good trees? How well positioned are they in the product space? OK. I showed you that Venezuela has very few monkeys and they're all in the periphery. Mexico had more monkeys and they were more in the center. So you calculate the distance from the monkeys you have to the empty trees, weighed by how sexy are those empty trees. And that's what gives us this other dimension. So you see that poor countries are here. They have few tree, few letters, but they, the letters that they have are not very complementary to other letters. So they, they are very far from other trees. OK, so my poor country, Venezuela, is here. India is over here. It has an intermediate number of letters, but it's super close to many things. OK, 
But interestingly, the second country here is Greece. So this is a completely different dimension. Here, India and Greece are more similar to each other. They are very close to, uh, to empty trees, meaning to technologies that for which they have many of the letters required. It's a, it's a short jump. It's a, a few chicken and egg problems. It's like between bear and zebra, OK? And Mexico is over here. And Austria is over here because Austria has already taken over all the good trees. They don't have any empty trees to jump to. So if Austria wants to grow, they have to plant new trees. They have to do innovation at the global scale, not just adaptation and ad adoption of, of technologies that already exist in the world. But for the emerging markets, call them the emerging markets, they have the possibility to grow by just ad adoption and adaptation of things that already exist. This is what this is capturing, okay? So we can do a, a two by two matrix. Here we would put countries for, the, for which they have more than enough letters. Um, and it's easy for them to get more because they're highly connected to other places. Here are countries that have more than enough letters but it's hard for them to get more, maybe like Austria. Uh, here you have countries that need more letters but it's relatively easy for them to get them because they're well positioned in the product space, say like Greece. And here you have countries that have few letters, that it's hard for them to get more letters because they're very poorly positioned in the product space, say like Venezuela, okay? Since we've done everything empirically, we can just look at which country is where, okay? So it would say that Greece is here in the stairway to heaven. By the way, you'll notice that I'm dated. All of these are when I was at Cornell. These were songs that uh, were popular when I was at Cornell. So, um, uh, so China and India are over here. That's the reason why they're growing so fast. Sub-Saharan Africa is over here, okay? Uh, and, uh, and so for each one of these countries, you know, the way forward is somewhat different. So to finish up, economic development results from the adoption of technology. Technology is tools, codes, and know-how. Of these, know-how is the hardest to move. It exists only in teams of brains. Know-how forms of accumulation and diffusion have outsized impact on, 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 on growth. Societies accumulate know-how by putting different bits of know-how in different heads and then bringing those heads together. Expanding the amount of know-how faces is chicken and egg problems, which in, imply that change tends to be parsimonious. You tend to move to things that are nearby. We showed how Thailand moved a lot, but by many short jumps, okay? Uh, and uh, countries differ in their positioning in the product space. And this, this paradigm, if you want, sheds light on a bunch of issues that we I haven't had time to talk about, migration, the issue of should you diversify or specialize, the role of exports in this whole story, et cetera, et cetera. That I won't have time to, to, to go into. Let me just say that to implement this analysis, we have um, created a website, which is called the Atlas of Economic Complexity. And in this website, you can look at any country, you can look at any product, you can do more than 30,000 different um, uh, visualizations. You can get into, into here are country profiles and it will tell you a story of your country told from the point of view of this economic complexity analysis. Let me stop there. I've gone, I'm sure, way too far, way too long, but I'm enjoying myself enormously and I'm really, really looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. We could not dream of a better start of the research series and, and a better way to to welcome you home, really very interesting, very, very broad. And, and really, I mean, we can have so many discussions after this one. And even if you say that, uh, okay, what you learn is not important, I think the diversity of Cornell is a witness to helping a little bit on your diversity theory, which is very interesting. So we have a number of questions. So I would say, because in the interest of time, I also, uh, we have here as well uh, uh, the, the president of Uniandes, the former president of Uniandes, that I would like him to say a few words, also a great Cornelian, Pablo Navas, and I hope he can also say a few words in a minute. 
But let me just go quickly to the question. So I would say for this order, in this order, Miguel Montoya, Pedro Arevalo, and then Leron G. I would say let's have all the questions at this point, and then uh, you answer, just because we don't have much time. So Miguel, we are going to allow you to, to speak. So Miguel, please. Uh, I think it's working. It's on yes, it's working. Please go ahead. Thank you, Lourdes. Mm. Miguel, please go ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lourdes. Uh, thank you, Professor. Oh, my only question is, uh, could, do you have some example of adding a valuable letter in some uh, Latin American countries? This means this, this letter that could move to, to, to from zebra to bear, to bear to zebra or something like that. And, and what is the role that the multinationals play trying to add letters to the, to the different countries? Thank you very much for the talk. A very nice uh, web page you have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pedro Arevalo, please go ahead. Uh, yes, hello, good afternoon. Uh, a pleasure to, to hear to the presentation today uh, from Professor Hausman and uh, also um, quite a, a proud uh, uh, Venezuelan as well uh, here. Um, so um, I, I was wondering how can we factor in the quality of the education of the different countries? I mean, I, 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 well, I found quite interesting the comparison between Ghana and, and Thailand. Uh, but where in the comparison can we factor and how can we factor in the quality of the different um, education systems, I suppose? That, that was one question. And, and the other question is, um, what sort of recommendation would you, would you give nowadays, Professor Hausman, to, uh, to a country such as Venezuela that perhaps has uh, lost uh, a couple of decades at least uh, uh, after the, uh, the recent uh, events in the country. Um, so what would be a path uh, to get back into the development uh, routes, would you say? And Leron G, please go ahead. Uh, Professor Hausman, so my question is uh, basically, um, uh, 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 have you considered the demand side factors? So for example, a, a country not making a certain products, more complicated products, maybe because they are not uh, they are not insufficient demands, or if the country start making it uh, because of the lack of uh, quality or lack of reputation or lack of marketing uh, capability to sell the products, the country is worried about uh, he's unable to sell those products, not because of he does not have capability to make the products, but more of a lack of demand uh, for the products. Thank you very much. So Ricardo, please. So uh, excellent. So the first question was, you know, do you have examples of adding letters? And it's very interesting if you look at the evolution of, uh, of uh, say, Mexico. Um, uh, you know, the north of Mexico started with maquilas and garments, uh, then moved to cars in the 1980s and into electronics and so on. So you see in the evolution of, especially the northern states and the, and the central states of um, in Querétaro, in San, San, San Luis Potosí uh, and, uh, and Guadalajara, uh, you see a, a transfer, a moving of the monkeys highly predicted by, by this framework, okay? So, you know, uh, Querétaro got into uh, aerospace, uh, not by coincidence. Um, it got into aerospace because it could offer an ecosystem of existing capabilities that it had built for the previous industries that it was hosting, right? So it's this idea that you build on the ecosystem. You, it, because you had one, one industry, you got those letters. Those letters are, in some sense, reusable by other industries, you know, bear to zebra. So, in, and I've done a lot of work in, in Mexico between Baja California, eh, Sonora, eh, Campeche, Tabasco, Chiapas. And uh, so we, we go and actually we developed an atlas of economic complexity of Mexico, where you can look at uh, Mexican municipalities and Mexican states and do the analysis at that level. And you see, uh, you know, the, the movement of monkeys in, in that direction. The, your second question was about multinational corporations. So it, I've looked a lot into the different channels through which these letters move. 
And so multinational corporations are definitely one of them. A, a, a corporation has some letters, if you want, internally, they always are located somewhere, but they can deploy so long as they find a place where they can mix the letters that they bring in with the letters that they're going to hire locally. So they're looking at what letters do you have? You know, what, what is the kind of infrastructure and human capabilities that you have that um, this industry would require? Can, can, can you host me kind of, right? So multinational corporations are a source of letters, but so is migration. Uh, migration plays a very important role. So is diasporas. Uh, diasporas is, uh, uh, you know, there's this very beautiful work by Annalisa Xenian from Berkeley, uh, the new Ar Argonauts and so on, where he shows how the diaspora, say in Silicon Valley, was cru crucial for the development of Bangalore and Hyderabad and for the development of, uh, of the startup nation in, in Israel and so on. So it's, it's, uh, it's people who can connect you from where, where that knowledge is. We published a paper in Nature in, in the summer on business travel, where we show that a business travel has also the role of, um, we show that business travel from a country with comparative advantage in a certain industry predicts your future growth of productivity, employment, and exports in that industry. So I'm, I'm asking myself, you know, with this shutdown of business travel, uh, what will it do to the diffusion of, 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 of know-how? Um, so Pedro Arevalo asks about uh, the quality of education. People think that know-how is education. And I have some slides, if we had more time, I would show you that know-how has very little to do with education and unfortunately, a little to do with the quality of education. Um, uh, the, the, uh, I, want, I want to say that um, education, this, this thing we're talking about, and forgive me for my physics undergraduate studies, it's a little bit like light, okay? Light has intensity, but it has spectrum, okay? And people look a lot to the quantity of education and what they call the quality of education, which is your result in the PISA score, where they ask the same thing to everybody. And the question is, how much did you get right, get right of the same questions? Collective know-how is really about the diversity of know-how in your society, not the intensity of know-how. So it's not like the intensity of light, it's like the spectrum, okay? And this know-how is not something that can be taught in school because a, most of what a society knows how to do, it knows how to do in its firms. And that's why the firms have to create their own know-how. That's why a, a freshly minted bachelor's degree or even a freshly minted PhD cannot take a top job in a firm, right? They have to, take an entry level job in the firm, and then they have to acquire that know-how through experience. And if you don't have the firms that make um, watches, you cannot acquire the know-how of making watches. But if you were to acquire the know-how of making watches, you would acquire it in the firm, okay? And that's why, you know, very manufacturing firms like Germany, countries like Germany and Switzerland have a, this mechanism of a, a accrediting the skills that you acquired on the job, right? So, so, so I think that uh, it, this problem is not solved by improving people's ability to read and write and do algebra. Okay, it's a it, it's 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 um, it, it's a broader set of skills than that, and it grows in this other way. Um, let let me uh, go on to uh, Leron. Uh, I'll I'll get to the Venezuela or the the policy recommendations later on for Venezuela. Let me, let me talk about, um, about uh, my response to, to Leronghi's um, question. So uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, that, I mean, the puzzle in the world is why, given how big are global markets, why is your country's market share so small? So there's plenty of demand in the world. So I think that the reason why countries export so few goods and so little of so few goods, it's not because there's no demand out there. There's 
a lot of demand out there. They have a minuscule fraction of the world demand. Now you say, maybe it's, it's not that they don't have the technology, it's maybe they don't have the quality or maybe they don't have the marketing to sell the product. But in my language, those would be letters. That is a high quality product would be a different word than a low quality product. And a letter would be the marketing skills. So it's one of the capabilities you need to have in order to be able to make money selling shirts. You don't need only to design the shirt and make the shirt. You also have to market the shirt. And if you don't know how to market, then you're going to lose the shirt. So, uh, so I think that those are, are perfectly uh, um, easy to incorporate within the framework. Uh, they, they are just one more, more letter. Um, on, on, um, on my recommendations in general, uh, first, uh, you know, my other line of work is something we call growth diagnostics, and it's about identifying the binding constraints that countries face. Um, and so I, I don't believe that there's such a thing as a perfect suit. Uh, there's only a perfectly tailored suit, and there's a lot that goes into the tailoring. So I don't have general recommendations. I have a framework in which to do tailoring, if you want, to try to analyze where the problems are so that we can think of solutions um, uh, that more broadly. In the context of, of today's talk, okay, it is about um, um, uh, uh, making sure uh, that you allow those letters to combine and that you add more letters. What has happened in Venezuela is that they took away people's rights and freedoms. They took away economic rights, they took away uh, civil rights, uh, freedom of the press, freedom of opinion, so, and they took away political rights so that, um, uh, you know, if things do go in the wrong direction, uh, you don't have the right to change the, change the course of, of events. In the process, they destroyed the economic capacity that was there and 5 million people left, uh, starting with a higher skill and then moving, moving to, to broader segments of the, of the population. So there's been a lot of destruction of capacity. So you can only start a road forward by first of all, empowering people. So you need to empower people with rights. Otherwise people don't want to play ball. You have to empower people with rights and then you have to allow them to do things, right? Because this in order, what, what is an entrepreneur? Is somebody who has no how, but also has no who. Right, he, he knows where the letters are. He needs to bring all these letters together to make a word, right? And, and, and you need to empower people to be able to do that, right? So that things that we used to know how to do, maybe we will relearn how to do. And, and then I'm sure that our diaspora is going to play a very, very important role in the transformation of Venezuela because our diaspora is learning to do things that you could not have learned in Venezuela because they're not being done in Venezuela. And so if the diaspora eventually returns or connects and so on, it will may allow a faster transformation of the country, but only after, after regime change. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, let me again bring uh, you back home. Uh, we see a Cornelian helping with the letters and the words for different countries. So tremendous congratulations. Excellent presentation, excellent. Uh, sorry that we cannot answer the questions of Evodio, Andres, and Yukin, but uh, no time. We are already 10 minutes late. Your presentation could give for a whole morning. And I would ask Chris to uh, have the closing words after me. Uh, sure. Given we're over, I, I won't. I won't say too much. Just want to thank you so much for for joining us. This is, I think, really a wonder of Zoom that we get to have you uh, have you uh, and learn about your fascinating work and high impact research. But also wish that it was in person so we could go out to dinner and, and continue talking about it. So, so thank you very much, Ricardo. And Arnab Basu, my co-director. Okay. So in the yeah. end, there is, yeah. Please I go ahead. Uh, thanks very much, Ricardo. It's, uh, it's a pleasure listening to you in person. And a small note over here, one of your co-authors, Hugo Paniza, was my classmate at Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. So I'm really aware of your work for a long, long time. So really, really uh, nice to hear you in person here today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
And then also a Cornel alum, Rob Cañizares, if you want to say a very few words, last sentence, you are enjoying, you are saying that you are enjoying very much the presentation. Yes, I found it fantastic. It was really very, very wonderful. And uh, I, I tried to copy some of the slides, but you were too fast. I love <laughs> the framework. And uh, by the way, I also went to engineering, applied physics and studied economics before my MBA. So I could absorb this like a sponge. <laughs> thank you okay. very much. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Next one, March 2nd, Johanna Mayer. Thank you, really, Maricardo. We hope that is the first of many. It took me a while, but next one, hopefully you will come uh, much better. Pablo, maybe you can just say hi. Another... Hi, and thank you. Ricardo, it was wonderful. Uh, I love your I love your your analogy with the spectrum and the intensity. That was new for me. So <laughs> thanks a lot. Very, very encouraging. And thank you, Roberto, for what you're doing. Have thank you very day. much. Thank you thank to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations to you all. Thank you.